Welcome to our, back to our series, A Concise Guide to Primitive Godliness. This morning we're going to look at a very important topic, the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment is a topic that is so critical to us in, our, in the end times because we know that Jesus is working in the sanctuary right now for us, and it's important for us to understand what he's doing and why. So let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father God, we praise you for all your goodness. We praise you for the opportunity to be forgiven. We praise you for your power working in our life to affect so many wonderful, miraculous, supernatural changes in us and, and to be able to use us for, to bless others. Father, I pray that you will be here in a special way this morning as we look into this important topic. I pray that your Holy Spirit will do the teaching, that you will open up our hearts and minds to you. May we be able to learn the information that we need to. May we be able to apply it to our lives, we pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God had a special job to do, and he needed a special army to do it. And so he commanded Moses, send into battle a thousand men from each of the tribes of Israel. So 12,000 men armed for battle, a thousand from each tribe were supplied from the clans of Israel. The battle that uh, was going to be fought was not an ordinary battle. It was, a, uh, in some ways, a very spiritual battle. It was led by a priest and accompanied by the holy vessels of the sanctuary. The Bible says that Moses sent them a thousand from each tribe to the war, and Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, to the war with them, and the holy vessels and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. After this battle was completed, something intriguing and wonderful happened. The Bible records that the officers who were over the units of the army, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, went to Moses and said to him, your servants have counted the soldiers under our command and not one is missing. God had this special mission. He raised up a special army and he blessed that army in special ways. Not one of those soldiers had died accomplishing that mission. Just before Jesus comes back again for the second time, he's also going to have a special mission. And he's going to need a special army. And the Bible describes this army for us. Revelation 14.1, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. The Bible goes on to describe this army further. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. This end time army, special army, that just like Moses' army, is going to be raised up for a very special job. These are going to be consecrated soldiers. They are going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are going to be pure and holy, loyal to God. And it's not just 12,000 in this army, it's 12 times 12,000, 144,000. And again, not one of this army will be lost. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. This is the mission that God is giving them. This is the great end time battle, the last conflict of the great controversy to fight the beast and his image and the number of his name. They will gain victory over the beast and his image and number of his name, and not one of them will be lost. The, the purpose of this army is to vindicate God to the universe. As we'll see, God is going to do some special preparation for this army, and he is going to be able to use them during an incredibly difficult time to do miraculous things. So let's look more about this army. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. This sealing is very important. It's critical to our understanding of this army and, and to the end times and to the investigative judgment that we're talking about. This sealing is how God's people will, will be rescued so that not one will be lost. What is this sealing? Well, 
It's nothing less than irretrievable surrender. Being so fully surrendered to Christ that they are immovable in Him, wholly drowned in the will of God so that they cannot be moved. To understand irretrievable surrender, we need to look at the sanctuary in heaven and see what's happening, what's going on there. What is Jesus doing right now? Have you ever asked that question? Well, for many of us, this, answer, this question is fairly easy for us to answer, right? We know that after Jesus died, uh, He was resurrected, and He went to heaven, and He went into a special ministry in the holy place of the sanctuary. And then, after the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel, God, Jesus moved from the holy place of the sanctuary into the most holy place of the sanctuary and did His end time last day work of Day of Atonement. This is a special day, a time of judgment, investigative judgment, and it is a cleansing of the sanctuary. So today we want to look at four questions. Here are the first two. <clears throat> the first question is, why does the sanctuary in heaven need cleansing? How is it possible that the holiest of holy place in all the universe, in the holiest place in the universe, how could it possibly need cleansing? And our second question is this, why is it taking so long? If Jesus moved into the most holy place of the sanctuary in 1844, after the 2300 year prophecy ended, it's been over 170 years since Jesus moved there. What is taking him so long? One thing we do know, and that is that Jesus is not piled under a pile of judicial paperwork. We are told that had Adventists after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, Christ would have come ere this to receive His people to their reward. So whatever it is that's taking so long, it's not God. It's not God's fault. It has to be something with us, something that we're not doing, something that we're missing. That leads us to two more critically important questions. Question number three, what is our role in Christ's Day of Atonement work? And number four, why, how are we failing at that work? Four very important questions that we need to understand as end time Christians, practical questions that help us to understand what we need to be doing and how we need to be doing it. So let's look at some of these, these four questions. How can we answer them? Well, we need to go back to the Old Testament sanctuary service so that we can get an insight into what's actually happening in heaven. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israel were required to gather about the sanctuary and in the most solemn manner humble their souls before God, that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. How much more essential in this antitypical Day of Atonement that we understand the work of our high priest and know what duties are required of us. Jesus is doing his part. He's been doing his part for over 170 years, cleansing the sanctuary. Are you and I doing our part? What is our part and how can we do our part? These are important questions for us. In the Old Testament sanctuary, when a, a person came to the temple to be forgiven for sins, he would bring with him a lamb. That lamb represented Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he would lay his hands on the head of that lamb and then he would cut the lamb's throat. This symbolized the transfer of his sins onto the lamb. And then the blood of that lamb was sprinkled on the altar and some of it sometimes was taken inside the temple. This symbolized Jesus covering those sins with his blood. Once a year then, the high priest would go into the temple and he would perform the Day of Atonement services. He would do the cleansing of the sanctuary. And this involved um, some special rituals, but in the, in the end, he would take symbolically the sins that had been piled into the sanctuary during that year and he would lay them on the hands of a live goat, a scapegoat, and that live goat would be taken into the wilderness where it would die. The heavenly sanctuary works the same way. When we confess our sins, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, takes our sins, transfers them to the sanctuary in heaven, and then covers them there with His blood. But notice, our sins are not destroyed. They're not done away with. They're merely transferred and covered. 
The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. My friends, our sins, your sins, my sins, are polluting the holiest place in the holiest place in the holiest place of the universe. When we confess our sins, we pollute the sanctuary in heaven. Jesus takes our sins, transfers them to the sanctuary, covers them with his blood, but they're not done away with, they're not wiped out yet. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. In the investigative judgment, in this, in this day of atonement work that he's doing, in this cleansing of the sanctuary, Jesus is working to blot out our sins for once and forever. So let me ask you a question then. Why are sins transferred? Why aren't they just blotted out right away? Well, it has to do with our free will. You see, when we come to Jesus in repentance, we are asking him to take our lives and to um, take our sins and to forgive us, and we are asking him to cover us with his robe of righteousness. But because of our power of choice, you and I can, anytime we want to, we can shrug off that robe of righteousness. We can leave that surrender relationship. And when we do that, we are filthy again. It's only when we are wholly consecrated to Jesus, covered by his robe of righteousness, that we are innocent in the sight of God. Paul tells us if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Because what we do then, if we go on willfully sinning, is we say, okay, Lord, I don't want your robe of righteousness anymore. I don't want to walk in that surrender relationship with you. I want to go my own way. And Jesus says, okay, have it your way, but I can't cover you with my robe of righteousness anymore. For if, Peter tells us, after they had escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for, worse for them than the first. My friends, that's a sad story right there. If we come to Jesus and we ask him to cover us with his robe of righteousness and we surrender our lives wholly to him, and then at some point we walk away from that, which is our choice, we can do that, we are worse off than we were when we started. The actual cleansing of the heavenly is to be accomplished by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. So when we repent, our sins are transferred to the sanctuary, covered by, by Jesus' blood, and now that he's in this day of atonement, investigative judgment work, his job is to blot out those sins, to get, him, to get rid of them completely, to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. But before this can be accomplished, there must be an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance of sin and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. The cleansing of the sanctuary, therefore, involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment. Jesus is working right now in the sanctuary, going through the books, to find out who are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. Now, of course, God already knows this. Jesus already knows this. But it's not just him that's doing this judgment. It's actually all the other universe. The universe has to believe, has to know without a shadow of a doubt that God's judgment is correct. That what he's doing is based on our choice, our power of choice, and not anything else. And so the universe is watching this whole judgment scenario, and God is showing them from the books of record who are entitled to these benefits of the atonement and who are not. So how does... How does how does God do this? How does Jesus know whose sins he can blot out and whose sins he can't? Well, <clears throat> for the dead, it's easy. The dead have already made their final choice. The dead are not making any more choices. So for a dead person, God can simply open the books of record, show the watching universe, this is the history of this person, and they were covered by Christ's righteousness when they died, or they were not. So for the dead person, blotting out their sins is easy, and that's probably been done long ago. The problem is the living people. How does God blot out the sins of the living when they haven't yet made their final choice? They could any time shrug off Christ's righteousness. How does God show the universe that he can blot out their sins or not? 
We know that when Jesus comes to this earth a second time, that uh, there will be living righteous people on this earth. And so that means that before he can come, he needs to judge these people. How can he judge the righteous living before he comes? How can he blot out their sins before they die, when they're still alive? The answer is that the living have to die. They have to be crucified in Christ, so that it is no longer they who live, but Christ who lives in them. In other words, they need to be sealed, irretrievably surrendered, immovable in Christ, having made their final choice. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, then they who are holy and righteous will be holy and righteous still, for all their sins will then be blotted out, and they will be sealed with the seal of the living God. It is that sealing, that irretrievable surrender, that final choice to be buried in Jesus, crucified in Him, to die in Him, it is that final irretrievable surrender that allows God to be able to blot out the sins of the righteous before He comes back. The Bible describes this ceiling, Revelation 7, 2 through 4, And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to him to, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. This sealing is a protection. It is something that God um, must do before he can unleash the final uh, scenes of this earth's history. We must be sealed. What exactly is this sealing? Well, we are told that it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. The sealing is irretrievable surrender. Being so surrendered to God, so thoroughly drowned in His will, that we will never, ever make any other choice than to be surrendered to Him. We have truly died in Jesus. It is no longer we who lives, it is He who lives in us, and we are there for eternity. So now we see how Christ can blot out the sins of the righteous living. It's because they have died. They have made their final choice. They have died in Him, crucified with Christ, immovable in, in, in Him, and they have made their final choice. The sealing is irretrievable surrender. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. That is the key phrase this morning. That is the phrase that I would like everybody to remember about this message. Let's read it out loud together. The sealing is irretrievable surrender. It is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. So let's review what we've learned so far. We know that Jesus is investigating those who have been forgiven. We know that He is blotting out the sins of those who have made their final choice for Him. And the dead have made their final choice, and so He can blot out their sins. And we also know that the living are being sealed. They're being settled into, the, into Jesus so that they cannot be moved, so that they will make their final choice even while alive. In other words, what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary right now is preparing you and I for that time when He can blot out our sins. He is sealing us. He is getting us to that point of irretrievable surrender. Sealing is important for two reasons. It plays very, two very important roles. One, it's necessary so He can blot out our sins. But two, it is actually our protection for the final battle. It is that sealing that is going to ensure that not one of His end time 144,000 army is going to die. Not one is going to be lost. He's going to be able to give them the victory in the worst battle that has ever been fought on this earth at the end times, just before He comes, the last great controversy battle, and He's going to be able to do it without losing one soul. And what's even more scary is that during this great battle, His end time army, this 144,000 that He's raising up right now, will have to fight this battle without a mediator. In other words, if this end time army, if one person, one soldier in that army commits one sin, they will be lost for eternity. 
For the first time in the history of this world, man will have no mediator. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. So here it is. The sealing has now been completed. This is what Jesus does. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, it is done. That censer represents his ministerial duties in the sanctuary. The smoke of the censer is, represents our prayers, and the incense in that censer represents his, uh, the aroma, the sweet fragrance of his uh, cleansing for our sins, his petition on behalf of us to be forgiven. And he throws down that temple, that censer, and he shuts down, essentially, the sanctuary and his work there. So when the living righteous are sealed, when they have become irretrievably surrendered, they are ready to take their stand against the beast and his image and the number of his name, and they are ready to do it even though there is no mediator in the sanctuary. Jesus' work is done. The Day of Atonement is finished. He throws down the censer and he closes down the doors of the sanctuary. My friends, the sanctuary is going out of business. There will be a time on this earth, and it's not too far distant probably, when man will be living for a short time before the second coming without a mediator. Jesus will shut down the temple service in heaven. I don't know if we can fathom that concept, you know, because since time immemorial, since, since Eve's first sin, we have had a mediator. Anybody who sins, no matter how many times they have sinned, can come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And Jesus says, yeah, sure, no problem, gladly. From the time of Eve until the present and even longer, we have had a mediator. Mankind has had a way to repent. But there will come a time when that will no longer be true. We will be living on this earth without a mediator. Those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. God is raising up an army right now. This symbolic 144,000, these will be the righteous living when he comes again. And he is preparing this end time army to be able to fight that incredibly intense last end time battle without a mediator. And not one of them will be lost. Not one of them will be lost, even though they have no mediator. How is that possible? It's possible because of the sealing. The only way that any person can live on this earth without a mediator and not be lost is as if they have been crucified in Christ and it's no longer they who live, but Christ who lives in them. It is only because the mediator is living our life. We have been irretrievably surrendered to him. He is living our life. It's the only possible way that we could live without a mediator and not be lost. So my friends, why is Jesus taking so long in the sanctuary right now? It's because he's stuck there. He cannot leave until you and I are sealed. He cannot leave until you and I are ready to stand in that great battle against the beast and the image and the number of his name without a mediator. If Jesus were to leave the sanctuary right now, it would all be lost because we're not ready. We're not sealed. We cannot stand without a mediator. And so right now, Jesus is preparing his people for that time, you and I. And how's he going to do it? He's going to do it through his Holy Spirit. In Malachi, we read, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may, be, uh, may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Jesus comes into the investigative judgment. That's what this is talking about. 
Jesus coming, the messenger, into the investigative judgment. And part of his work is to send the Holy Spirit as a refiner's fire and a fuller soap to prepare us, to cleanse us, to seal us, so that he can leave the sanctuary and come again. The coming of Christ, which is here referred to, is not his second advent to this earth, but his coming to the investigative judgment. This is talking about this verse in Malachi that we just read. In the most holy place of the sanctuary in heaven. Thus, the message is especially to us. Even though it's written in the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, this message is especially to us who are living in the time of the judgment. And the culmination of this refining, this cleansing, we have a word for that. It's called the latter rain. But who can receive the latter rain? Who can receive it? Only those who prepare. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. I saw that, they, that many were neglecting the preparations so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. Those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is, that's the Laodicean condition right there, right? Will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they need to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in His presence. Strong words, strong words of encouragement to you and I as God's end time people. He's saying now is the time to prepare. Now is the preparation time because a time is coming when the sanctuary in heaven will close its doors. The sanctuary is going out of business. And after that time, there will be a time of trouble, a great battle between God's end time people, his end time army, the 144,000 and the beast and his image and the number of his name. And the sealing is the key to surviving that time. That irretrievable surrender is the key to survive, surviving that time. And it will be the Holy Spirit that will get us to the place where we are fully sealed, that we are fully surrendered to him, irretrievably surrendered to him. But not just anyone can receive the latter rain, only those who prepare. And right now is the time to prepare. The present is our time of proving. The experience necessary in order to gain the crown of life will bring us far greater crucifixion of self than we have hitherto thought possible. Self is preventing us from being fully surrendered. Self is keeping us from being filled to overflowing with the latter rain, Holy Spirit power. Irretrievable surrender is the only cure. And irretrievable surrender does not happen overnight. The sealing is a process. It is a process of preparation. It is a process that, that must begin right now. Now is the time of proving. Now is the time of preparation. So let's go back to our four questions and see if we have what we need to answer them. Question number one, why does the sanctuary in heaven need cleansing? Because your sins and mine are polluting the sanctuary in heaven. Number two, why is it taking so long for Jesus to cleanse the sanctuary, right? He could, he could judge all of us in a nanosecond. But because of the watching universe, he can only blot out the sins of those who are dead, who have made their final decision. And for the living, he is waiting for us to be ready so that he can seal us, so that he can make us immovable in him, so that he can make, give us that ability to make that final choice 
that choice to be wholly surrendered to him no matter what. When we have made that final choice, we have essentially died. We've died in Jesus, crucified in Christ. When we have made that final choice, then Jesus, in view of the entire universe, can blot out our sins and say, that person has made their final choice. They are covered by my righteousness for eternity. The third question we ask, what is our role in Christ's day of atonement work? Our role is to humble ourselves and to work with Jesus in that preparation process. Our role is to use our power of choice to say, Lord, I want you to be perfectly in control of my life. I want to surrender myself to you like I have never done before. I want to be perfectly surrendered in you. It's our job to use our power of choice to say, Lord, I choose to surrender. It's his job to actually affect that surrender. Only he can do it, but only we can let him. Only he can do it, but only we can let him. Question number four, why or how are we failing in this work? It's because we, as lukewarm Laodicean Christians, are not willing to make that radical commitment to Jesus. You know, the real scary thing about Laodicean Christians is that we think that we are fine. We think that we are saved. We think that we are surrendered. We think that we are converted. And yet we don't realize our true condition. Because the thing about Laodicean lukewarm Christian Christianity is that we, we want all the blessings and advantages of being surrendered, but we also want to stick a toe out so that we can kind of, you know, dabble in the world a little bit. And we think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's okay. You know, yes, I'm converted, but sure, I'm enjoying the world a little bit. It's just a little thing. And besides, God isn't finished with me yet. It's because of that attitude. It's because of our unwillingness to radically give ourselves wholly to Jesus that he is stuck, that Jesus is stuck in the temple. Not able to do that work of irretrievable surrender in us, which he must do. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. A great battle is coming, a, a battle that will test us to the very core, a battle that God is right now preparing an army for, the 144,000, and he's going to prepare so well that not one of that army will be lost. Despite the incredible tens intensity of the battle, not one of them is going to be lost. He is doing that through the sealing, that irretrievable surrender, that settling into the truth so that we cannot be moved. Our final decision is going to be Jesus. And when we have made that final decision, Jesus will throw down the censer and we will live on this earth for a time without a mediator. Are we preparing? Are we working with the Holy Spirit right now to have that irretrievable surrender? Is Jesus getting control of our life, our choices right now? Irretrievable surrender is a process. It takes time. Right now is the time of preparation. Jesus' work in the sanctuary is to prepare us. And he is, has sent his Holy Spirit out right now in power to prepare us. And he will send out the Holy Spirit in even greater power soon. But in order to receive that greater latter rain Holy Spirit power, we have to be working with him right now to empty us of ourself to the point where he can fill us to overflowing with himself. My friends, are we willing to do that radical thing? to give ourselves wholly to God, unreservedly, unresistingly, unrelentingly, and irretrievably? We can. God has given us the power of choice. We can say, Lord, I choose it. I choose irretrievable surrender. And God, if we work with him, God will give us that irretrievable surrender. It may take some time. It's going to be a process. It's going to be a growing process. It's going to be a struggling process. But by our power of choice, we can say, Lord, I give it to you. I give it to you. I give it to you. And he will be able then to affect that irretrievable surrender in us. But we have to be willing to make that radical surrender, that radical commitment. And very few, even in the Christian church today, are willing to make that choice. But you and I can. Anybody can. It's our choice. We've been given the power of choice. It's our choice. Let's make it for Jesus. Shall we pray? 
Heavenly Father, there are some scary times coming. But we are so thankful that we can be your soldiers, that we can be prepared by you, that we can have your armor, that we can have the assurance that not one is going to be lost if we are wholly surrendered to you. Father, grant us that irretrievable surrender. Grant us the willingness to radically give you all of our choices, every bit of our lives, every area of our lives, all the time. We so desperately need this, Father. Prepare us, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.